Welcome to uh, my midterm project. It's on a most beautiful place and something that has been long in the making over 100 years. And that is the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is on our National Mall. And as you can see in the backdrop of this picture is the Washington Monument. And to the left of uh, the museum is the National Museum of American History. So it took a lot to get this project on the mall, but when they decided to finally make sure it was on our National Mall, they put it in a picturesque setting and in a pivotal place to give it to the respect that it deserved. It opened in September of uh, 2016. I visited twice, uh, once in 2017. Uh, January 10th, and the other time, November 10th, 2018. I wanted to give you a, a backdrop, a background, uh, in terms of how the museum came to be. It's been over a century in the making. In uh, 1916, a group of African-American leaders came together to create a national memorial building dedicated as a tribute to the Negroes' contribution to the achievements of America Initially, uh, it was to honor the black soldiers and sailors who had battled in the Union Army during the Civil War, uh, and then they expanded it from there. Uh, and that came about because in 1915 was the 50th anniversary celebration of the uh, Civil War, and uh, they had events surrounding that, and this came out of that uh, time period, mainly because of the discrimination that was uh, traditionally hoisted upon the um, black Union soldiers who had fought in the Civil War. And in 1926, um, you see this picture. It says a National Negro Memorial at Washington. That, that was never built, but that's what they um, were proposing. Uh, it w had a lot of grassroots support, but uh, Congress uh, was always opposed to building this memorial. And finally, it did get approval in, um, on March 4th, uh, 1929. Uh, Calvin Coolidge signed a public law, but didn't guarantee funding. And you know what happened in 1929 after March. It was a stock market crash, so it got put on the back burner. Let's jump from 1929 to the 1960s. The civil rights movement is in full effect, but it's a white Jewish congressman from New York named James Shure who introduces a bill in August 1965 to create a Negro History Museum Commission, appointed by President Lyndon Baines Johnson to study the advisability of establishing such a museum. Congress failed to act on this bill and on several other nearly identical bills in subsequent years to establish a Negro History Museum Commission. Why? In Robert Wilkins' book on the museum, A Long Road to Hard Truth, he titles this period, a proposal without a patron. Surprisingly, many blacks during this time period did not embrace the notion of a federal black history museum. Adam Clayton Powell, the legendary congressman and minister from Harlem, represented many grassroots organizations when he spoke against the concept, saying, whether or not such a monument, a museum of Negro history, is constructed should depend on the Negroes themselves. The impetus must come from within the Negro community, not from outside it. Local congressmen from Boston, Detroit, and Chicago opposed the museum because they felt a federal effort could detract or draw support away from local black museums in their cities that were already functioning. But Congressman James Shure was not to be deterred. The term ally is popular today, but Shure is more than an ally. He was an accomplice. In 1967, a group of congressmen led by Shure introduced a slightly modified bill that sought to establish a commission for the study of Negro history and culture. The bill eventually gained an audience in March 1968 before the House Select Committee on Labor. 1968, what a year. Definitely the most pivotal year in the decade, one of the most pivotal years in the history of our country. So pivotal that the National Museum of African American History and Culture has a wing dedicated to the year. A Change in America, 1968 and beyond which features a wing, Events of 1968. Many witnesses appeared before the committee, but I only want to highlight two. Jackie Robinson, 
the Baseball Hall of Famer who broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball, and James Baldwin, esteemed writer and social critic. Robinson observed that many sins of commission had been committed against African Americans, including exploitation, racial discrimination, and violence. But he also asserted that the sins of omission had been just as bad. One of the major sins of omission has been the failure of historians and educational authorities to assign to Black Americans the credit they richly deserve for the collective and individual contributions they have made to American history and culture and to the growth of this country. James Baldwin said supported creating the commission, but he warned Congress that my history contains the truth about America. It is going to be hard to teach it. Baldwin maintained that even though the task was difficult, it was nonetheless essential. If we are going to build a multiracial society, which is our only hope, then one has got to accept that I have learned a lot from you. Now, a lot of it is bitter, but you have a lot to learn from me, and a lot of that will be bitter. That bitterness is our hope. That is the only way we get past it. Baldwin explained that white and black America were interconnected and could not be separated. I am the flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. I have been here as long as you have been here. Longer. I've paid for it as much as you have. It is my country too. Do recognize. That is the whole question. My history and culture has got to be taught. It is yours. To cut a long story short, the commission bill came up for debate in September 1968 passed the House by a significant majority, but died in the Senate, again dashing hope for establishing the commission. What you might not know, unless you're from the state of Ohio, is that since 1988, there has been a museum in Wilberforce, Ohio, called the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center. Congressman Clarence Brown, my namesake, way to go Clarence, announced legislation days after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated to create a national museum and repository of black history in his home district. Wilberforce was founded in the 1830s by manumitted black people and had been a center of the abolitionist movement and a station on the Underground Railroad. The Wilberforce Museum was rejected by the National Park Service as an appropriate location for a national museum, and it was determined in 1976 that the Smithsonian Institution should run any such museum if it were ever created. In uh, 1987, I call this guy our uh, protagonist. Um, that's John Lewis, was elected to Congress. Uh, and in 1988, he started pushing for a museum. Every year, he would uh, have a bill trying to get the, it approved. Never got much headway. Um, 1994 on, I'm from the state of North Carolina. The senator from my home state, Jesse Helms, who was notorious in terms of uh, a Republican senator and notorious in terms of his racial views and his bias, he created roadblocks for the museum. He denounced the museum from the Senate floor and said, once Congress gives the go-ahead for African Americans, how can Congress then say no to Hispanics and the next group and the next group after that? And when John Lewis would propose it, Jesse would bring people up and bring it up and fight against it. Uh, and so uh, in 1996, because Helms is what now I call our antagonist. So we got John Lewis, the protagonist, Jesse Helms, the antagonist. And then we have the person I call the doer and connector. In 1996, Judge Robert Wilkins enters the fray. He wasn't a judge then. He was... Uh, in the public defender's offices, in office in Washington, D.C. area, I believe. And he eventually got involved and became head of the commission, actually quit his job in the year 2000 so he could fully devote his time making sure that this happened. And uh, he brought all sides together, both Republicans and Democrats. And in 2003, Congress authorized the museum and then the fight began where to locate the museum. They initially wanted to put it off the mall, but obviously, uh, given the historical significance of blacks in this country, we fought for it to be on the mall. And I've already gone over where it's uh, situated. Uh, it's a wonderful venue. So 
The next movement, phase of the movement, comes in the mid-1980s. And this time, the goal of the movement is squarely to create a national museum that will be on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And Mickey Leland, a, a congressman from Texas, and, and Congressman John Lewis, who would just been elected from Georgia, lead that effort. Uh, congressman Leland was tragically killed in a plane crash in Africa while he was visiting um, some relief and refugee uh, missions that he was working with. And so Congressman Lewis picked up the mantle and became the leader of the effort. So John Lewis is able to get it passed in the House in 1993. They thought, this is great. Now we'll be able to, to do this. We'll just get it past the Senate. It passed the Senate the year before. Senator Jesse Helms decides that he's going to make it his personal mission to block this museum. And the senator from North Carolina filibusters it, and it can never become law. So in 1996, when I became interested in this, the effort was dead and the organizations and coalitions that had been built had disbanded. John Lewis was able to build a bipartisan coalition around 2000, 2001 to support this. Senator Sam Brownback of Kansas, a Republican, uh, came on board and made it his mission to make sure that this museum would happen. So did Congressman J.C. Watts of Oklahoma, who was in the House Republican leadership, Senator Max Cleland, um, Lewis's uh, fellow Democrat from Georgia, came on board, and they were the four musketeers, so to speak, who led the effort in the House and the Senate on both sides of the aisle to get this done. And what was amazing was they were able to get all of the leadership on both, both the Republican and Democratic Party of the, in the Senate and the House behind it, the chair and ranking members of, of the important authorizing committees and appropriations committees behind it, so that when they introduced the legislation in May of 2001, they had as original sponsors all of these key players. And at that uh, press conference, which, which I attended, it was amazing. You had everyone from the four I've spoken about, Lewis, Brownback, Cleland, and Watts. You had Rick Santorum there, senator from Pennsylvania. You had a new senator, Hillary Rodham Clinton, there. You had um, this assortment, this bipartisan supportment um, of, of legislators there. And... Um, and Senator Brownback even remarked, you know, you don't see this combination of people together doing anything, hardly ever. <laughs> but they were all there to support this National African American Museum that they thought needed to be built and needed to be built on the National Mall. Things were going great, but we had another issue with timing just a few months later September 11th, 2001, the attacks to the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And that changed the whole legislative focus in Congress. Things turned towards war, Patriot Act, new Department of Homeland Security, investigating what went wrong, intelligence failures, et cetera. And it took the steam out of the, the momentum um, for this and we had to kind of go to a plan B which was to create a presidential commission to further plan and make sure that there would be the fundraising and private support for this museum to get it done. I served on that commission and chaired the site committee um, because that was a very controversial issue of where this museum would be located but we investigated sites and we found sites on the National Mall that we thought were appropriate. And this bipartisan commission unanimously agreed on a report with draft legislation and we entitled it, The Time Has Come 
to symbolize that after all of these decades of fits and starts and opposition and passing things but not giving it adequate funding, et cetera, this museum needed to be built. And Congress passed the legislation. It passed on a vote of 409 to 9 in the House and by unanimous consent in the Senate. So it had this great bipartisan support. The issue of its site was very controversial. Congress couldn't agree on the site. And so they punted that issue to the Smithsonian Board of Regents. But in January of 2006, the Board of Regents voted to place the museum on the National Mall at the center of the National Mall, directly adjacent to the Washington Monument at 14th and Constitution Avenues. Congressman John Lewis' statement on the groundbreaking in 2012 for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, an idea whose time has finally come. Since 1915, African Americans have called for the construction of a fitting tribute to African American contributions to America's history. Despite dedicated activism and even a presidential commission working to establish a museum as early as 1929, the idea did not come to fruition. Over the next century, authorization for a national African American museum lagged as other memorials and national museums were approved, built, and supported with federal funds. Legislation finally came to establish the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2003 as a result of renewed private and political advocacy. Selecting a museum site, designing a building, acquiring collections, and growing a staff would take more than a decade. Thank God for John Lewis. President Obama has formally opened the U.S. National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, nearly a hundred years after it was first proposed by black Civil War veterans. Together with Ruth Bonner, the daughter of a man born a slave in Mississippi, they rang a bell from one of the first churches organized by black people. I know that years from now, like all of you, Michelle and I will be able to come here to this museum and not just bring our kids, but hopefully our grandkids. And together we'll learn about ourselves as Americans, our sufferings, our delights, and our triumphs.